Our speaker today is Dr. Jesse Berlin, this guy working very hard here uh, to get the slides onto the stick that we can then transfer um, so that you can view it. Um, and he has a story, of course, and I'll just tell part of the story. Um, but he originally um, did a biology degree at Yale and then went on to Harvard where he was in biostat and got his PhD or SCD there. I don't know. It's SCD they give there. Um, and was actually, now they give PhDs? Okay. Now we give both too. Um, anyway, um, and he was a student in biostat at Harvard at the same time I was a student um, here, but except I was living in Boston, and he was also working on publication bias like me. We were young once, and um, and that's how I got to know Jesse, because we were working on the same topic from different perspectives, since he is a biostatistician. Anyway, then he went on to Penn, um, where he's a biostatistician for 15 years, and um, worked there from 1989 to 2004. From there, I think he got sick of uh, writing grants, uh, although I hate to speak for him, uh, like we all are, but he acted on it and went to J&J, &J, uh, Johnson & Johnson, um, and he's now head of global um, epidemiology, or global head of epidemiology. Um, and what they do, I asked him this morning, well, what do you actually do? And they do a lot of... Um, post-marketing studies, looking at safety, uh, natural history of disease, um, and, uh, and that type of thing. So they interact a lot with FDA, mostly about safety. And um, he's still active in writing, and you may have seen a recent article in the BMJ, I think he's second author, about... Um, of course, <laughs> about um, adverse events. So um, we're really lucky to have him this morning. Thank you, Tanjing, for the rescue. And he's going to talk about um, this working group on safety uh, that he is part of leading. I'm not exactly part of, Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me and I give this you on. Jesse Berlin. Okay. <coughs> I, can you guys hear in the back? Okay. Good. I, I am always weird about asking that question because the people who really can't hear are not going to be able to respond and say they can't hear. Where is there a, a hoo-ha? Yes, there is. Uh, does it work? <coughs> yes, okay. You need to know up, which is up and which is down. Um, so just a very quick word. I, my, I, my position is based in the office of the chief medical officer at J&J. &J. Um, it, it's removed, uh, very deliberately removed from R&D. It's removed from the commercial. It, it's its own separate kind of organization. And, and it's specifically there to be kind of the, the patient advocate kind of uh, organization. Uh, the usual disclaimer. I, I do want to remind people this is, you know, what I'm going to be presenting is on more or less on behalf of a working group, so it's not just me. So somebody else does not disclaim the results. But, and I know also that no matter what I say, people are going to say, oh, it's that guy from J&J. &J. Uh, yeah, these are just some of the other people who are involved on the, in, with the work. Um, you, you guys are going to have copies of these slides, so you can go through the names. Um, it, 30 contributors. The, the main point here is that the way CMS works, and I'll, I'll get into this in a minute, um, it's a mix of, of very few academics, but it's mostly regulators, so people from health authorities from around the world, and people from industry. Um, so that's the composition of the group. Um, Stephen Evans, most of you will know his name. Um, was the, the token academic um, on this effort. So here's what we're going to talk about. This is awkward. Um, uh, current challenges, you, you guys can read these. Uh, we'll talk about the aims of the guidance. Um, importantly, where it will help. And you know, this audience, I assume, knows a lot of the basics. Um, and you understand meta-analysis and systematic reviews. So what I'm going to try to focus on is the, the aspects that are specific to this work and, and specifically to the assessment of safety, drug safety, during development. 
And th there are some twists and turns that are a little bit different from what most of us are used to thinking about. So I'll, I'll, I may or may not get to observational data because um, our paper is still out there. Um, uh, this is, I, I happen to be reading, coincidentally, the, the Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, which is about HeLa cells, which were basically taken without permission, and you guys know the story. So this is just, a, it's a quote from the book. Um, this is directly from, from Johns Hopkins writing to the board, his, his initial board of trustees, when he created, he donated $7 million to start up the, uh, the charity hospital and uh, the medical school. So very much focused on providing service to the community for free for people who can't afford it. Uh, so this, this was borrowed from a slide by Stephen Evans, uh, who has done a lot of work with CMs over the years. Uh, and I, I think that after between three and four years of working with CMs, I think most of us came to appreciate um, the, the impact that these CMs reports have. And I'm not trying to inflate the importance necessarily, but these CMs documents, these reports, tend to have a way of, of becoming a uh, policy. Um, so this, this may go into something that's through ICH, International Conference on Harmonization, or it'll work its way into FDA policy eventually. Um, so that, that was really the intent. Um, that people who have worked in industry, anyone? I know there's at least one in the room. Um, there, there are these things, when we get an adverse event report, people fill out the CMs form. And that was product of the first CMs working group. So that, that's kind of an example of how these things evolve. Um, and, and I mentioned this, it's, it's worldwide, it's academics, regulators, and industry people, kind of all in the same room, all kind of come, trying to come to consensus. And some of what you're gonna see through the talk is, you know, how do you come to consensus in a group that's that diverse and, and you know, the minute you get two statisticians in the room, you have probably four opinions about what's right. Um, so some of that's gonna get reflected in here. What's the line I heard? You could take all the statisticians in the world, lay them end to end, and still never reach a conclusion. Um, so what, what was the origin of where, why did this group get born? Um, I, I'll show you in a minute really more specifically, what, what was the impetus. Um, so it, it's many recent meta-analyses have had a major impact. Um, and there's one in particular that got all of this discussion started. Um, and that one, I'll keep you in suspense, you probably already know what it is. Um, that one led to severe restrictions on the marketing of a product and the indication um, it was withdrawn in, in, uh, in Europe. Um, so they're, they're, it's generated a lot of big issues in the media. Um, this particular one was being debated in Congress before the publication was actually in print in the New England Journal. Um, and more and more, there's an, the expectation that industry is going to be performing meta-analyses, um, sometimes also systematic reviews, but... Um, let's call it meta-analysis for now, the quantitative piece. There's the expectation that we're going to be performing meta-analyses on a fairly routine basis. And so that, that generates the need for us all to be sure that we're talking about the same thing, um, using uh, the same sorts of principles, not always the same kind of method specifically, but understanding the same principles and applying those in a, in a rigorous way, an unbiased way, and a transparent way. So... That, that's kind of where this all came from. Oh, I did, I did, so I, I said this before, usually we, we're used to thinking of meta-analysis of efficacy, and that, that's where this gets to be different, and it, particularly in the context of drug development, adverse events are a whole another planet. So this, uh, this is the one. Um, I mean, there, there are some other ones, but it's, where is it? Where's the pointer there? Um, where is it? Rosy glitazone. 
So the rosy glitazone one was, was the one that generated, most of you will remember, generated a lot of discussion. And 20 papers since then reanalyzing the same data and giving rise to new methods for sparse data. And so all because nobody wanted to believe what the original analysis showed. Um, so this, this is the oops after many years of debate. So Avandia was withdrawn in Europe, severely restricted in the US. And then after a bunch of reanalyses and some new data, um, some internal debate at FDA, I, I'm not gonna get into the, the details of the story, but in the end, they lifted the restrictions. They decided, oh well, hey, we kind of got it wrong. Um, so, I, you know, it's nice that it's not often that a regulatory agency reverses a decision like that. Um, so the, these are just um, other examples of high profile uh, meta-analyses, some of which conflicted with each other. Um, Cefepim I'll talk about in a minute. So Cefepim is another one. Um, this is Tarek Hamad. Some of you may know Tarek. Um, he was at FDA for a while. He's at Merck now. Um, this is one of his favorite. He worked on this when he was at FDA. Um, it, Cefepim is a broad spectrum antibiotic. Um, it's approved for a variety of indications. So there's an, an article in The Lancet uh, raising the question about increased mortality based on a meta-analysis. And so now here's this result that FDA has to decide, what do we do? Um, so they issued an early communication, which is what they usually will do, saying we're aware of this issue, we're looking into it. But you know, meanwhile, use due caution when you're using this drug. That, that's kind of the gist of how these things go. Um, relative risk of 1.26, statistically significant. So higher all-cause mortality compared to other drugs in the same class. Um, um, so report adverse events. And then um, a while later, FDA redid the meta-analysis, going back to original sources, so not just taking the same data and, from the publication and reanalyzing but going back and tracking down the literature, tracking down unpublished studies. So they redid the whole thing and came to a different conclusion. So they concluded based on a, a bigger, um, I may or may not have been more rigorous, rigorous but more inclusive meta-analysis showing no increase in risk. Um, so that, the point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, we, we like, as academics, we always, we kind of like to think that our study, our meta-analysis is the definitive answer. And then somebody comes along and says, oh, well, you missed this, you missed this. Here's this new study. So it, it's supposed to be a lesson in humility. Um, and, and so why that becomes a problem, like, you know, that same sort of phenomenon, the knee-jerk reaction. We all want to believe anything based on randomized trials and particularly anything based on meta-analyses, you know, there's that pyramid that everyone wants to believe that with meta-analysis of randomized trials at the top of the pyramid. Um, but, you know, what the, the working, the CIAMS working group came into this uh, basically asking, you know, are, are we doing the right thing? You know, what are the cautions? What should we be worrying about? Um, so uh, th this kind of just summarizes what we've already been talking about. Um, that, so one, one point which we'll come back to is most of the events that we're talking about are fairly uncommon, infrequent. And so that makes it complicated statistically, uh, but it, it goes beyond that the difficulties are more than just how do you combine sparse data tables, right? That, that's a solvable problem somewhat, although there's still no consensus, but Gary is going to tell us how to do it. Uh, so, but it, but it's the, the rarity makes it more challenging on a couple of levels, and we'll get into that. Um, and, and nuances, you know, when you, the, the other, this doesn't, uh, do we try, there's time pressure. Um, all right, this is saying do a protocol, which you guys already know. Um, what's missing here, there's a piece missing, which I'm going to get to. Um, 
which has to do with not just the rarity of the events, but how adverse events actually get collected and reported in clinical trials. And, and that's where the, the comment, I'll go back up, this comment about um, sources of bias. So in, in a lot of these situations, you know, one misclassified event moving from one group to another or disappearing from one group can end up making a difference between a significant result or not. And so that you get worried, I get worried, when results are that sensitive, it's like, okay, before we jump to any conclusions. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, and right, so this is from the regulatory perspective. And this whole exercise from SIAM, so it's very much focused on what do you do as a regulatory body? What do you do with the information? And so um, FDA spends a lot of time, well, all these guys, but FDA in particular spends a lot of time reacting, right? Think of it, every time somebody publishes a meta-analysis showing you know, drug X increases the risk of outcome Y, you know, FDA has to do something. So I, that, I don't envy them. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a fair point. But I will say most of the time they come from academics. And that, that was actually not my wording. So I think that was Stephen Evans, the one academic. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I get it. Right. I, I get it. But, um, you know, from the FDA perspective, it's uh, easy is the wrong word, but you know, the, the easy part of this is relatively easy from the, from the regulator's perspective is generating the result. And now you, the, the regulator has to respond to it. So, you know, it's kind of, as an academic, you're a little bit like a grandparent. You know, you play with the kid for a while and then you give it back to the parents. So, I, I'm being a little cynical, but... Uh, you know this, you know this, right? This is just saying pa power is part of the reason we do all this. And I'm not going to get into that. Um, so why, what, was, what was the point of doing the CMs and what was not the point? Um, so setting out general principles, and, and you'll see where, where you can't come to consensus, cannot come to consensus with a bunch of statisticians and epidemiologists is on getting into the details of the methodology. So we, we backed off fairly quickly into not making this a, a statistical methods textbook, but making it more of a guiding principles. And if we can at least agree on the guiding principles, then you know, we can have a separate discussion about the details of the methods. So where is it going to be helpful? We think, um, and I've mentioned this, this point, that there are, are unique aspects to worrying about safety meta-analyses. Um, and so one of the goals is to get industry to be better at what they're submitting. So generate something that's more transparent, more rigorous, uh, more explicit, um, and, and to urge caution and interpretation, kind of above all. Um, but as I've said, there, there's no, we're not getting to the point of making very specific, narrow recommendations about methods or software. Um, it's not a complete guide on reporting. There, there's Prisma, um, which covers some of this. Um, so this is meant really more as a supplement or a complement with an E um, than, than as a standalone. Prisma, you guys know about. So who are the target audiences for this? Uh, Non-statisticians. So we did have some non-statisticians on the committee, the working group. And they were the, always the ones raising their hands and saying, I have no idea what you guys are talking about. Uh, so that, that kind of led to a, a structure for the, the book, um, which has its six chapters. It's got two more technical chapters, <laughs> which are written with all kinds of summaries that normal people can interpret. Um, and basically, it says, 
you know, you, you can read the summaries and not miss anything important. Uh, so that, that was our, our way of addressing the broader audience. Um, so everything we, we tried to make as clear as possible. Uh, for the statisticians, it's sort of pointing them to the literature, point, making the statisticians aware of what the controversies are. Uh, and so then they can go off and make their own decisions about specific methods. Um, and then again, reminding people that there's a lot of uncertainty. In, in spite of what sometimes looks like a lot of statistical precision, there can be a lot of residual uncertainty. Um, how did it actually get done? A lot of meetings, a lot of emails, a lot of reading drafts, a lot of redrafting and redrafting and redrafting. And, you know, anyone who's ever written by committee understands how that can go. And, and you know, debating over specific words in specific places. Come on, guys. Um, so I was part of the editorial group. So I was one of the people who got really into the debate about should this be which or that? <laughs> We're not quite that bad, but. Uh, so there, there was a process. Um, and then there was a review process. It, it's not quite the same. Um, anyone who's ever, has anyone worked on Institute of Medicine or now it's National Academy? When, when you do these Institute of Medicine reports, there's public, they post, they send it out for review. Things are posted more publicly. Uh, and in some other, AHRQ, when it does things, you know, they, there's many groups make things very public, make the whole review process transparent. This is not that. This was a handful of people who provided comments, sort of more or less privately. Um, so that's just how CMs does things. So that, that was not our choice. Um, I got to see some very interesting places. We went to Singapore for one meeting. So, um, table of contents. How am I doing? Good. Um, so it's th this chapter. Whoops. Which button? This one. Th this planning and analysis and reporting. I'll, I'll get into the contents of each of these chapters at, at, at a high level. Uh, but it's these chapter three and four that are the more technical chapters. And so I, I would expect people in this room, you know, if you're picking up the book, that, that's where you'd want to pay more attention. Um, and chapter five, for me, um, I'll say this again, gets to the interpretation. So for, for a regulator, what do you do with the information? And it kind of ties together all the other chapters in a way that, that speaks to, you know, how to, now we've got this done, how do we evaluate it, how do we interpret it, and what action, if any, do we take? Um, so because we thought the world needed yet another definition of meta-analysis, here's our definition. Uh, and, and it's very deliberately done, I'll, I'll show you. Um, so I'm going to read this. Statistical combination of quantitative evidence from two or more studies to address. So two or more was a big debate. You always, how many have gotten the question, how many studies do you need to do a meta-analysis? Right. So we're saying two. Uh, to address common research questions, common meaning the same across, not that it's a frequently occurring question, uh, common research questions where the analytical methods appropriately take into account that the data are derived from multiple individual studies. So. Here's the explanation. So, so I said this before. Um, we, we're deliberately not restricting ourselves to uh, something that necessarily follows a systematic review. And the, the reason for that is that, well, first, we're often in the position of having all the data. If you've got a new drug, then there's no literature. Um, but e even if there's... Uh, there is other literature. Sometimes you need to do things with individual patient data, participant data, um, that you can't necessarily get from everybody. Um, so we, we wanted to be more general about what we think about. And, and you know, recognizing that systematic review is always a good idea when, when, it's, um, when there's literature to include. But when there's not, or there's another purpose for the meta-analysis, then 
Uh, we wanted to include that sort of activity. Uh, preserve within study co comparisons. So the, the main point we're making here, not, not crude pooling. So don't, don't do the add up all the numerators from all the treatment groups and add up all the numerators from the control groups. Right? That's not what we're doing. But we're also not saying, because there are some more recent methods that, that um, don't necessarily adhere very strictly to the idea of making a within-study comparison first, so doing the, the kind of traditional stratified analysis. There are other approaches around now that are, are somewhere in between crude pooling and, and fully stratified. So we wanted to make sure to include those. So, so this, it gives you a sense for the, the level of uh, obsessive, compulsive about some of the wording here. You know, so all, all this is very deliberately chosen. Uh, so, chapter two is the background. Chapter one. Chapter two is the background. So this is just the context, the regulatory context, kind of the why are we doing this. Um, systematic, so this is the, the principle here. Was that me beeping? Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so, so part of the point is any point in drug development, this sort of quantitative approach summarizing somehow across studies can be used. And that, that's not what we always think of when we think of systematic review and meta-analysis. And it may end up helping us think about how to direct the rest of the development program. You know, if we're seeing um, a, a trend for an adverse event, then that says, OK, now for the next phase three study, we probably want a specific data collection form for this adverse event because now we need to start adjudication. We need to worry about this a lot more than we did when we went into the program. Um, and a lot of this is just the rationale. Um, planning, this is the table of contents from the planning chapter. Um, you, you'll see kind of, ba basically this is like the outline of the, what the protocol should be. That, that's essentially how we approach this. Um, need for a protocol, I probably don't need to emphasize to this group, um, but defining the question in advance, not kind of as you go along, right? Seems sort of obvious to people here. Um, getting, making sure you have all the data. Uh, if you're going to exclude trials, make sure you justify that. Um, so kind of really basic principles, but not ones that we think everybody necessarily understands. Um, Right, and potential sources of bias. Um, so this is the point I made earlier, that um, when, when you're doing these safety evaluations, they, they're often dealing, I said this, often dealing with infrequent events, rare events. Um, most of them are not pre-specified as endpoints in the protocols for these studies. But the routine adverse event collection, uh, right, there's, there's a specific protocol for how we collect adverse events, but most often they, they just kind of turn up, you know, the investigator elicits kind of how are things, and that's how the adverse events get generated, and then there's a whole process for classifying them. But none of that's uh, typically pre-specified at, at the level of detail, you know, here's what we mean by an MI, you know, here's the definition, you need these enzymes, and it, it's not that usually unless that's going to be an endpoint for the trial or an outcome. I think we decided that's outcome, not endpoint. I don't know, Kurt, anyone? You guys are on Kurt Minert's mailing list, some of you. It's outcome, sir. Got to learn that. Uh, so so that, that's, that's a main distinction. Like Normally, when we're looking at efficacy, yeah, things are much more clearly specified and pre-specified. Um, so typical things you'd find in an analysis plan, um, you know, defining the population. Then this, this is an important one because um, we, we had a lot of debate about, uh, you know, what, what's the default analysis? You've got a bunch of studies. 
And in any given situation, maybe the right answer is look at everything. But maybe the right answer is, well, we're only going to look at things, at studies that looked at the marketed dose. Or, you know, you, you can come up with a rationale for a lot of different approaches. And, and it can be full, well justified. But the point of this, and, and there's one or two people who are very insistent on including this, is that, you know what, anytime you make one of those decisions, it's, there's some judgment involved. And somebody else looking at the same situation may not make the same judgment. So let's show everyone what happens if you include everything and then back off from there and argue for why that may not, necess may not always be the right approach. Um, and then missing data, summary effect measures, this is all kind of standard stuff. Subgroup analyses are a big one. Um, and then you, know, you pre-specify whatever you want, and then there's always one more that turns up later on. And so sparse data, that's, we spend a lot of time talking about sparse data. Uh, choice of outcomes, OK, very as specifically as we can. Um, one of the challenges is when, particularly when you're working across multiple, uh, multiple sponsors, multiple companies who have done these, multiple investigators, um, academic or otherwise, um, the definitions of things are not always quite the same. Um, we had an analysis of TNF alpha inhibitors years ago, and there are three or four companies involved. It turned out there, there are all kinds of differences in how we collect adverse events, over what time period after the end of exposure, for example. And how did you document malignancy? Uh, there are subtle differences that can matter. When you're talking about one or two events per trial, that sort of stuff matters. Um, and then Stephen Evans had done a paper somewhere along the way um, where, where they looked at publications from trials um, and this, this was, it was a short letter, I think, in, in The Lancet. Um, so 11 out of 37 trials had changed the primary outcome between what the protocol said and what the publication said. Um, 32 out of 37 had unreported or new secondary outcomes. It right? wasn't in the protocol. Uh, and selective reporting, uh, misuse of subgroups, you know, all, all of this stuff. And th this is an academic group making these judgments, not industry being defensive. Um, so this is actually Stephen, Stephen's comment, but these are nearly all non-industry publications. Um, and so uh, the point is, be careful about what you're doing. Uh, analysis, a lot of the same issues now. Further down the line, now you've, you've planned everything, you've done it. Now, how do you actually do the analysis? How do you report what you did? Um, so uh, usual sorts of stuff. What were the measures? Treatment effect. Um, what was the model? You know, uh, justify the choice of the model. Um, we spend a fair amount of time talking about Bayesian approaches, which have a lot of advantages in this setting, especially when you get into the, the rare events, the Bayesian approaches. Um, have, have, or seem a little stronger. Um, multiplicity is a big issue, um, especially if you're doing, if you, you're like you're monitoring, you're, you're repeating the meta-analysis every time a new study gets completed, then <clears throat> you do need to worry a little bit about the fact that you're doing the same thing over and over again. And, you know, if you beat the data into submission, they'll eventually uh, surrender. Um, heterogeneity, which is ongoing theme, this group probably understands more than most, um, that often the point becomes understanding why the results vary from study to study. <clears throat> and sensitivity analyses are a big topic in meta-analysis. Um, and then we've got a checklist. That, that The main difference between our checklist and Prisma is that we've added some stuff on Bayesian analysis and what you ought to be reporting from Bayesian analyses. Um, so what are some of the, the issues we grappled with? Um, fixed versus random. Now, we, we couldn't even agree on, is it fixed effect singular or fixed effects plural? And, uh, so this is kind of where we ended up, was just pre-specify it, 
justify it. And, and we go into some considerations about it, but you know, most of those are, um, we, we like to believe we can judge whether they're all actually address, all these study designs were meant to address the same question. Um, but often there, are the, you know, where do you draw the line about what makes something different enough not to be relevant to this analysis? Uh, so basically we're saying, you know, pick a myth, pick a model, justify it, explain why you did it, and, uh, <coughs> and then if there's heterogeneity, rather than worrying about fixed versus random in that context, get into understanding the heterogeneity. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know why that's there. Should be, should be one word. I'll fix that. Uh, I, and I'm just, I'm not going to get into details on multiplicity. We we cite a bunch of literature, um, but but there's this is a subtlety that that we kind of appreciated as we went along. There there's a bunch of sources of multiplicity here. One is that you've got multiple endpoints, outcomes, right? So it's not just one adverse event. It's, you know, in any given context, there may be five or six that are kind of very obviously relevant and another 200 that we collect along the way. And so, uh, you know, deciding what to include and why is, is an important choice, uh, but that's a source of multiplicity. Um, analyses of the same outcome over time. So if you're monitoring things, uh, as you're accruing data, that's another source of multiplicity, and then the subgroup question. So, and those are just three off the top of my head. Uh, so it, it's an issue. And you know, at, at a minimum, which is kind of where the book ends up, at a minimum, you need to be very careful about how you interpret things because of that possibility for multiplicity to lead you astray. Um, and then th this is another subtle point that um, is important in the regulatory context, and that has to do with, the, do you want to err on the side of being more sensitive or more specific? And you know, if you're a regulator, then, and, and your job is to protect the public health, then you know, maybe, and I'm saying maybe, maybe you want to err on the side of being more sensitive, and therefore, at least as an initial approach, forget multiplicity adjustment. Let's know what the, the unadjusted p-value is, um, right? And if it's mortality, we had a big debate uh, on an, another multi-company meta-analysis um, uh, for the erythropoietin stimulating agents. We had, we had all given data to one of the Cochrane groups to do a participant-level meta-analysis of mortality in the oncology setting. And um, statisticians from one of the companies and the statisticians were most, were, uh, it was a German company. They were mostly German statisticians. And the steering committee was that the academics were mostly Swiss. And this debate about multiplicity adjustment, where mortality is the outcome, went on for a while. And, and finally, two things happened. One was, um, I, I was one of the people who pointed out this is going to be published in a highly visible place. It's a controversial issue that's been around for years. And you're seriously going to say this p-value of 0.04 for increased mortality is not significant because we're adjusting for multiplicity. Like, seriously? Who's going to buy that? Um, that was one thing that happened. And the other was that the Swiss accused the Germans of being too, uh, too strict. <laughs> Um, okay, the rest of this we've kind of covered. Uh, Bayesian analysis, the you know, unified framework. I, I, I'm not going to be a huge salesman for Bayesian. I, I think the main message on this slide is that the, the Bayesian analyses ha, are uh, kind of a unifying approach to some of this. And so I, I think we're urging people to at least consider <laughs> Bayesian approaches. And you know, having said that, if you asked me if I could actually implement one, I still can't, but, uh, but I think they're good. Um, and one of, one of the advantages is this idea of these post hoc probabilities, which, which is really, you know, that's the, the great thing about, for me, about these Bayesian analyses is 
they, they really have the interpretation that you want them to have. And this idea of what's the probability, given the data, what's the probability that the true underlying odds ratio or hazard ratio is bigger than one or bigger than two, right? So that, that's the kind of inference that you want to be able to make. And that's what the regulators need to do. And so that, that's a very useful aspect of, of this. Um, and I, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to run out of time if I get into all the details here. Um, sensitivity analyses, we've covered, pre-specify them. Um, here's the set table on reporting. We're into chapter four. We so subtly transitioned here. Um, I, I'm not going to reproduce the whole table, but you know, it, it's there. It's in the book. It's, you'll have the slide. Um, and then this chapter five was really, for me, um, it, it was the most challenging. I, I was not on the chapter five writing group. Um, but on, because I was on the editorial committee, I spent a lot of time reading it and rereading it and commenting. Um, so this gets into the, the, the whole the thought process around how do, what do you do now? Um, so it's evaluating the findings, um, first impressions. You know, what, we look at this, and what, what's, our, what's our reaction? When, when this shows up on the front page of the New York Times, um, what are we going to say? Uh, so that, that's the first impression piece. But then getting into the, the more thorough, detailed evaluation of what did these guys actually do? Did they even tell us exactly what they did? Um, how does it mesh with existing evidence? How does it relate to the, our understanding, our current understanding at least, of the biology? You know, is what we're looking at remotely plausible? Uh, could it be bias? So all of those kinds of considerations. Um, and, and then often it's not, the randomized trials are not everything we have in some situations at least. So there might be times when we'd want to go to, to um, observational data to at least see what's going on out there in, in, in the so-called real world. Um, and this point I've, I've really covered, it's this whole idea that um, these adverse events were not originally part of the protocols. And so how they get collected um, can, can be variable. And that was really one of the controversies around the Avandia rosiglitazone meta-analysis was MI, except in one or two of the bigger studies, MI, MI was included as one of the specific outcomes. But in all of these smaller studies, it was not. So exactly how it got captured um, and why it got captured and when it got captured that, that was um, part of that debate. Um, so it makes things more challenging. Um, th there's not a lot of regulatory guidance. Um, we've covered these other, we, we've covered these other points. Um, the last bullet I'll just mention again, um, just as a reminder, you know, this, this book doesn't get into uh, kind of formal benefit risk quantification, uh, but it, it's just a reminder. And, and, you know, we had to remind ourselves we're writing this whole book looking at adverse events, and we have to keep reminding ourselves that you know, there are benefits to many of these products, and we can't forget about the benefit when we're, we want to put the, the adverse events in the context of the benefit. And, and essentially, the trade-off is, you know, do you do more harm by not treating than by treating and having an increased risk of an adverse event? So that, that's the discussion. That's That's what I do every day uh, in my, my current role. And there's not always agreement, surprisingly. Um, what else on chapter five? Uh, interim communications, you know, what do you do? You've got a preliminary, preliminary result that might be published. So how do you respond? Uh, and I'm not gonna give you the answer because we still don't know. Um, it, it's a framework for evaluating the technical aspects. Um, are the conclusions consistent? Can they be consistent? Um, how to integrate the results? Impact on labeling. So this, this bottom one is really, it's literally and, and figuratively, the, the bottom line here is, what do you do now? Do you change the label of the drug? Do you withdraw the drug? Uh, do you say, yeah, nice to know, but we're not ready to make a, a 
take action on this. So all of those are options. And, and the, the regulators, I, I was impressed that this was a good group that on, on both sides, that um, the industry people who are involved take all of this. This is the job of all of these guys. Um, so they, they take all this very seriously. But the regulators also, um, you know, people are not making arbitrary decisions. Uh, and so uh, right, there's a lot of anxiety. And, and I really don't envy colleagues at FDA because it, it's a tough job. Chapter six gets into resources, um, more having to do with how, to, how do you actually, you know, who do you need around, uh, what types of people, what types of, of tools do you need. Uh, I said before, we're specifically avoiding recommending software because this is CMs. So we, we couldn't even say you know, like, you can do these analyses in Stata because that might be interpreted as an endorsement of Stata, which CMs can't do. So, and even actually in my current job, I found out that I can't say anything specific about a specific you know, tool or something because it'll be interpreted as J&J &J endorsing this other product and we can't do that. Okay, great. Um, I've had to learn over the years to. I, I'm I'm generally fairly un, uninhibited about what I say, when I say it, to whom, um, but I have learned to muzzle myself on occasion. Um, so what the conclusion? You, you, you've had this. Encourage careful design. Um, encourage registration of protocols. Something I, I haven't mentioned. But people know about Prospero. Um, it, it's an ongoing debate we have in J and J. We, we've worked on several meta analyses now with teams, and I, I think the tide is beginning to turn. Uh, all, all you have to do is tell one of the because on, on a couple of occasions it's been the uh, people on the business side who come to us with a question. You know, can you help us with this meta analysis of this question? And the first thing we always talk about, the second thing we always talk about, after we get through what's the question, how are we going to do this, um, we get into the discussion of should we be registering or shouldn't we be registering this protocol? And, and sometimes it's just a matter of saying, you know, this paper, even if you have an academic co-author on the paper, you've got a bunch of industry authors. Therefore, inherently, you know, for whether this is appropriate or not, uh, anytime you've got industry authors on a paper, it's going to be viewed with more suspicion. And so if you want to um, try to calm people down and tell them, um, look, we're actually trying to be rigorous about this, being able to say we posted a protocol is an important step. And some of the journals now are actually asking for registration of the protocol. So. Um, so we're making some progress, um, encouraging good reporting, encouraging critical appraisal. The, the slide, this slide originated with Stephen Evans also, and he had buy the book. <laughs> and I had to, have to run this past the lawyers. And usually it's pro forma. This time one of the lawyers came back and said, well, you can't really say buy the book because that would be J&J &J endorsing. <laughs> It's like, well, actually, Jane Day does endorse this, but I'll change the word. Uh, so, okay, thank you. I ended it with a few minutes for questions. So, thanks. Uh, Uh, yes, yes and no. Part, part of the point of this is that if, if you're updating, you kind of go back to the, the, we had a paper years ago now, a few years ago, this SPURT, Safety Planning Evaluation Reporting Team. And that, that's the first place that we, we, a few of us who have been following each other through this process made the point that you can actually use, if, you up, if you're updating the meta-analysis as you go along, <clears throat> then uh, part of what may happen is you may identify adverse events 
that you hadn't really thought about, hadn't expected. And so that may shape the development program after that, uh, which would mean, yes, so it might actually turn into um, MI is a, a secondary outcome, and now we have to define it, and now we have to get a specific data collection form. Um, so at that level, um, but I, I, otherwise, and they, there's ongoing discussion because it, it's, you know, it's done, I, I think it's, most companies probably do it as uh, diligent a job as they can of collecting the events. It's kind of what happens after that and you know, how much standardization is there. And that, it's a challenge when you have so many different kinds of events. Um, it, it's a bit of a daunting task to come up with rules for all of this. So, you know, we try to, within a program at least, we try to standardize definitions. So, um, I saw a hand over here. Yeah, um, I wonder, and just your opinion, do you think that uh, when there is a life-threatening adverse event that an, uh, a publication-based meta-analysis could be considered a first draft, but it should trigger an individual patient data hmm. meta-analysis hmm. afterward as being a gold standard, or at least wait for that before yep. uh, reaching any decision? Um, so, yeah, interesting question. Um, I, I'll say a couple of things. One is whenever we have individual data, we like to work with individual level data. So just as a rule. Um, and you saw the example of FDA redoing meta-analysis. So I, one, one answer to your question is it's not just a matter of whether you're looking at individual versus you know, aggregate level, but it's a matter of making sure you're doing things right and you have all the relevant data. Um, but, but the other, the, the danger of following your recommendation, this is what we did, by the way, with the erythropoietins, was there's a bunch of literature-based stuff, and finally Cochrane said, let's get the individual patient data. Um, but the, the danger with that is that you don't always get all the data. And, and it may just be, um, you know, we're, we're now, we, J&J, are now sharing data um, fairly easily. Um, you go through Yale, through the Yoda process, and we give you data. Or we give you access to data. Uh, but, so not every company is doing that, and not all the academics are sharing data. And so, and some of these trials are so old that, you know, we, we worked on, when I said Penn, we worked on something in, in uh, kidney transplant, where it was like literally the guy had the data on index cards in a shoebox in his garage. So, yeah. So, and then, right, if you leave stuff out, then the challenge is, why'd you leave that out? So there's, in the back, you were, you had your... Yeah. And, you know, are you trying to keep these analysis into that at all? Or? Uh, yes, and, yes and no. Um, let, let me just give you an example. We, we had a, um, we, we were invited uh, a, two or three years ago now to an FDA advisory committee meeting about uh, v, VTE, venous thrombotic event risk for orthoevra, which is a contraceptive patch which, by the way, is no longer marketed in the U.S., but not because of the safety issue. Um, this question was, does the patch have a different safety profile compared to the equivalent oral contraceptive? And it's not even a question that you can really ask because the, the pharmacokinetics are so different that what do you mean by equivalent? Uh, so that, that's a whole other debate, but we ended up you know, after a lot of internal discussion, and we had Noel Weiss from University of Washington, and we finally convinced Noel that we should do the meta-analysis, because he didn't even want to go there, because it's observational studies. Uh, so we ended up doing the meta-analysis. FDA had done its own big study, which we then incorporated into our meta-analysis of our studies. So we had a result that said, you know, if you believe these studies, 
and you know you can debate methodology forever, but if if you're willing to trust the results of these studies at all, then doesn't it make sense to understand cumulatively what do they say? What are the boundaries? Just worrying about statistically, what are the boundaries on the relative risk, the confidence interval? So we did that. We presented at the advert the advisory committee, and FDA updated the label, including the basic the results from the original studies, but they didn't want to put the meta-analysis in there. Um, so I, I think at this point, um, probably the, the assumption is that the, the usual sequence is the, the, the question is going to arise um, generally before the meta-analysis gets done, but could go in the other direction. Um, and, and the meta-analysis is going to inform the labeling decision. But I, I haven't seen a lot of movement toward incorporating the actual meta-analysis result into the label. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yep. Not, not that I can reproduce off the top of my head. Um, yeah, there's a ton of literature. Um, my, my default answer to that is um, I think the Bayesian approaches have a lot of advantages in sparse data. The, the idea of borrowing strength from the other studies you know, gets you around some of these challenges about having all, all these zeros floating around. But you know, if you ask L.J. Way, he's saying do risk differences and you ask somebody else, and they, I don't like I said, I don't think there's consensus yet. So, yeah, Gary. Um, so in terms of, again, rare side effects um, and incorporating observation and post marketing information, um, I mean, you said you're going to probably not have time. To yep, that, yep. But can you summarize briefly? Well, the example I just gave is a, right. is a good illustration of you know, where do we end up. Um, th there's, <clears throat> there's a lot of discussion ongoing now, um, a little bit more so in the device world, medical device world, about can we actually use observational, non-randomized data to make regulatory decisions. And it's already being done to some extent in the device world for effectiveness decisions. Um, it's been done forever for safety issues. If you go to any lab, go to oral contraceptive labels, it's full of epidemiology. So uh, most, I, I won't say that everything in labels ha has an observational study basis, um, but, but there are some very good examples of where it's the observational study that gave rise to the change in the label. So nobody has any problem incorporating, if, if there's something bad, then epidemiology is okay. Um, if there's something good, that, that's where the, the discussion becomes, what's the right level of evidence? And, and that, that's probably fair, I, I, I think, for now anyway. So the uh, follow-up question is, um, again, dealing with rare events, what, if, what do you think of uh, just looking at Yeah. Compared. Yeah. Yeah. Dangerous. Dangerous. Just because you you think you know what the background risks are, but you know in, in a given randomized trial, um, your your background risk in the placebo group. Right. The, the way patients tend to get selected into trials is. Right. They're, they're healthier than the general population of people with the same disease. But that's and so, study to study variation. There, there's, so there's just random variability, but there's also selection into trials. Right? And I, I can't think of an example. We've, we've, anytime we see an increase in anything, the first thing they want epidemiology to do is go and look at the background rate. And you know, we do it, but then we say, but there's really no, you're not going to save the drug 
by looking at background rates from some other context. Because, you know, look at our own trials. If you look at our placebo group, it looks like being on placebo is protective. It's like, okay, that's probably not right. Being in a trial might be, but, you know, it's hard to know what it means, but it's just a dangerous precedent. And, you know, the other thing that happens to us, and I, I yelled at people for 10 years now, but that in, in some of the, in looking at biologics in particular, uh, there, there's often the randomization is not one to one. It's two to one or three to one, you know, you've got multiple doses. And, you know, where's the event going to show up? If you've got three to one randomization, where's that rare event going to show up? Duh. So, it's like, you know, I, I know you think you're helping yourself, but in fact, you're setting yourself up. Are, are we done? Because, yeah, I don't know if there's another class coming in here, but... Um, All right, well, I, I'm around, so... He can answer questions. We've left five minutes. Busy schedule. Yeah. Answer questions and hang out. So thank you so much. Right, thank you.